Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. We're going to start this session, uh, which is the practical tips of grant writing, as seen by myself, uh, which is Professor Gareth Levy from the University of Birmingham. Um, I'm a Wellcome Trust Senior Fellow and has previously held fellowships through the UK system, uh, particularly the BBSRC and I've said the Wellcome Trust. So my expertise really is in fellowship grant writing. But speaking today is Professor Chris McCabe, also from the University of Birmingham, who is a molecular endocrinologist and has extensive experience across the grant funding landscape as both a chair of panels, as a grant reviewer of probably thousands of grants ranging from small to fellowships to major programme pieces, and also has extensive experience of chairing major grant funding panels. So throughout the session, can you please um, put your questions continuously into the question and answer sec section and please use the thumbs up. So the, the questions that get the highest thumbs up, we will try to answer as a matter of priority. So I'll hand over to Chris McCabe, who will now take us through, uh, through his thoughts on grant writing, the practical do's and don'ts, and then we will finish the session, hopefully have a, a, a useful discussion at the end. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Gareth. And I hope everyone uh, can hear me. Uh, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. So today um, we're going to talk about uh, lots of different levels of grant writing, small grants, project grants, PhD studentships, programs and fellowships. And I mean, there's some caveats to this. Of course, I'm aware that uh, this is a very international audience and my experience is mainly with UK funding, uh, but also with European and, and American funding. And I think the same is true of Gareth as well. Um, so we're going to try and concentrate on, on main principles of grant funding that will be applicable to all sorts of different international um, settings. So my experience then is on both sides of the table uh, as someone who writes grants and who judges grants. Um, until recently, I was chair of the Wellcome Trust Basic Science Interview Committee for several years. Uh, and before that, um, I was a panel member of the Basic uh, Committee for the Wellcome Trust. Uh, I've also sat on the clinical uh, interview committee for the welcome. I've chaired the science committee for the Society for Endocrinology, which considers lots of small grants. I've been an external reviewer for multiple um, large program grants and, and institutional bids, uh, a panel member of the Health Research Board of Ireland. And myself and my group is mainly funded uh, by project grants and fellowships from Medical Research Council in the UK, the Wellcome Trust, the Royal Society, uh, NIHR, uh, CIUK, BBSRC, uh, etc. And really all this experience has told me is that writing grants is mainly failure. So it is small moments of success amongst long periods of abject misery. And I think the reason for that, of course, is that hit rates for grants are actually quite low, um, ranging uh, in my experience from around 2.5% to around 25%. And if you ever see a grant that has a hit rate of about 25% or above, then go for it because uh, that's as good as it gets. Fellowships are very um, competitive and often around 10% hit rate. And of course, we know that it only takes one bad uh, peer review to, to sink your grant. And we'll talk about some mechanisms to try and overcome that. But I think philosophically, rejection is an opportunity to come back stronger and with better ideas. And it's painful, but this is how science moves forwards through failure and then through better ideas. And it's that successive application that, that really is what you need to work towards. When we talk about writing grants, of course, there are, there are different levels and phases of this. Um, you may start with an expression of interest and, and an American grant I'm currently writing at the moment has a, a two page expression of interest. And this just allows the panel to know, uh, have they got the right people on the panel? Is your work going to be of interest to them? You may also start with an outline of the grant um, and lots of funders want you to submit an outline. This is usually where you flesh out all of the experiments. Uh, but you don't fill it in the finances and all the other stuff. It's just, again, it gives them a chance to look at your application and see whether they want to take it to the next stage, which would be the main grant application. And after you've applied uh, through the main grant, um, you may, it depends on the scheme, uh, get uh, the opportunity to respond to the reviewer's comments. This is usually a three or four page document, and it's very, very critical uh, in terms of grant writing to get that right, because that gives you the opportunity to refute or, or re agree with or whatever the reviewer's comments and also to put new preliminary data in and fresh uh, imperatives, et cetera. 
and you might then for a, for a fellowship or a program grant uh, go to interview and of course for interviews it's critical to practice 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 and in fact in the UK often uh, some universities put their uh, interview candidates uh, through acting lessons to uh, to make sure that when they walk into the room uh, they are very well rehearsed so we'll talk about some basics then. I mean, some of this is very, very obvious, but I think it's, it's worth uh, restating it. Um, so apologies if you know some of this stuff already, of course, but the, the, the important thing to start with is, is attention to detail. Nothing irritates your reviewers more than spelling mistakes, typos, poor grammar, et cetera. Reviewers also don't like uh, dodgy statistics on preliminary data. If you're gonna include preliminary data, make sure the statistics are, are really strong. Um, if the costs are inappropriate, of course, that will annoy uh, administrators and they'll get rid of it. And if you don't have the correct number of pages or figures or format or font, again, these are all little things that collectively say to the reviewer or the panel, actually, this is not a great grant application. So you can get actually rejected before they even get to the science just by annoying reviewers with these kind of problems. So when you write your grant, what you're looking to do then is, is present a, a clear and logical flow. You're looking to outline a compelling vision of your work. So this is why it's important. This is what I want to do. But you also, and this is really critical, have to acknowledge the caveats and the difficulties uh, through alternative approaches. So whether you embed that into the prose of what you're writing or whether you have a separate section, but you need to show your reviewers and the panel that you, you understand not everything will technically necessarily work, but you've thought of other ways around that problem. So you may say, you know, um, if we fail to construct uh, the mouse knockout model in AIM2, we will instead use an existing model, but we'll cross it on a different background and whatever, that, that will solve the, the issue. So you need to be honest about the things that will and won't work and what you can do for those things that are difficult. It's also important when you're writing it to think of the balance of experiments. Um, you know, have you got the right balance? And I'll come on to that on the next slide. And of course, you have to make it look nice. And so if you're hopeless with PowerPoint, uh, find a friend who's great with PowerPoint and make it look good because we're human beings and we like looking at pretty things. Now, one thing I know Gareth's very keen on and I'm very keen on as well is, is a strong first page to capture the reviewer's attention right from the outset. And you won't be able to read this, but these are two examples of recent grants that I've submitted. On, on the left, um, this is a, a program grant, a very large program grant that I recently wrote. And I just want to illustrate that what, what I do when I write grants is I go straight in with the importance, the relevance to human health, and the, develop a hypothesis and have the aims, and maybe even a model there which shows the biological system that I'm going to try and pull apart or you know, investigate in the, in the application. And then on, on the right here uh, is another, is a large project grant that I recently wrote. And again, it's going straight into the importance, selling the hypothesis and the broad aims. And again, you know, for me, I think it's very important to put a model in there and show again the biological system that you're gonna seek to experiment upon. So timeframes are, are really important at, at, at a couple of different levels when it comes to applying for grants. Um, you have to make time to, to apply for a grant. For, for me, for, for a, a large project grant or a program grant or a fellowship, I would want six weeks really to write that thing. And that would be concentrated time. I would want to blank out days in my diary where I have time to think and I have time to write and I have time to consider everything. It's very, very difficult to write a good grant if you do half an hour here in between Western blotting and half an hour there in between something else. You know, you need to have these dedicated periods of time. And the, the second um, issue of, of timing is that of momentum. So really, uh, you should only go for a grant when the time and the data are right. So, you know, you need to be at that moment for that scheme where, you know, you're absolutely uh, flying at that moment. If you, if you don't do these things, if you don't make time and you don't go at the right moment um, and you put in a rushed application, the chances of, of success will be even lower and you'll probably end up wasting your own time and that of others. Now, when you're writing, it's, it's important to think of the balance of what you're writing and, and the balance goes at two different levels. The, the first level of balance is, is that of the grant philosophy. So what you really want to aim towards generally uh, is innovation, so new stuff that's innovative, it's ambitious, it's exciting, but it's not wildly unrealistic. 
So it's getting that balance right between new exciting stuff that's never been done before and will move the world forwards, but stuff that you know stands a very good chance of actually working. And then the second balance of uh, the second area of balance really is the balance of approaches. I mean, you may be someone who works on chromosomal alignment in, in very fundamental cell work, um, and that's fantastic. Often what sells really well, though, in, in grants is having that fundamental cell work, but having a parallel stream of animal work, which allows you to challenge your observations in the whole animal context. And maybe uh, human data there, maybe correlative data uh, on, on outcome uh, so that you can relate this to the human condition. And it's that what I would call virtuous circle, which often presents as a very balanced uh, series of approaches uh, in a grant. Also, I think um, technique wise and systems wise, you need to have a multiplicity of systems. So several systems, you don't want to have four years of Western blotting. You want to have uh, something where you're, you're looking at your research question through the lens of different techniques, which each bring something to it, but also validate those other techniques so that you really explore the hypothesis in three dimensions and you can't be assassinated um, for just going in a very linear uh, way. And this, this linearity of proposal uh, also comes in, in in not writing a linear proposal where one aim hangs on the success of another. And this is a classic thing. And you have to remember, you know, people who review grants aren't there to uh, award you the money. They're here, there to try and assassinate you. And um, if you write a linear proposal where, for example, making a zebrafish model in aim one, then means you'll be able to explore that in aims two and three. That's really dangerous because if you don't make that animal model, there's no point doing the rest of experiments. So those linear proposals are something to avoid as well. What you really want are a series of aims that are uh, in some ways overlapping, in some ways parallel, in some ways bringing something to the other aims, but not contingent upon each other for success. Otherwise, it's a, it's a load of dominoes and, and uh, you can be assassinated for that. This is a phrase, uh, fit to scheme, that, that we heard, uh, we used to use a lot. So when I uh, chaired the, the Wellcome Trust Basic Science Interview Committee, we would look at about 550 grants a year. And um, this, these were the Sir Henry Wellcome uh, Postdoctoral Fellowship Scheme. And it's a very prestigious scheme that allowed um, early postdocs to go away for four years to the world's greatest institutions and, and do great science. And we use the scheme, uh, the, the phrase fit to scheme a lot for those people who put applications in that weren't in the spirit of the scheme. So it's really important that you, the proposal you write is in the spirit of what the grant funder wants. So for example, if people put in to just stay where they were in their own institution for four years, that was not in the spirit of the scheme. And so that was not a good fit to scheme. And so those people would be rejected. So it's really important to read the funders current guidelines and they do update them quite a lot and research priorities and make sure that what you are writing is really what the funder wants. Um, sharing is caring. I mean, we um, have a, a system at the University of Birmingham and Gareth and I are very much uh, engaged in this from the outset where people who are writing grants uh, will pitch the ideas, maybe a five slide sort of synopsis of their grant idea and an idea of which funder they want to go to. And they'll pitch it to more to experienced colleagues who maybe sit on panels. Uh, who will then feed back and say, well, look, you know, I, can, I think that's terrific. Maybe not that funder, maybe try that funder, or maybe this, this bit of work won't, you know, won't pay off. Um, so if you can, within your institution, I think it's very important to try and share your ideas, share your proposal, often at an early stage, but if you can't, at a later stage. And of course, you can ignore the advice of these experienced people, and that's great, that's life, it's democracy. Um, but sometimes there's something very transformative in their comments, and more experienced people around you may sit on panels and have really good insight into what those panels want. When you write a grant, um, it's very critical to have specific outputs in it. Uh, and you should do this in every grant that you write. Uh, and in fact, you can work backwards from these standpoints. So an example of a specific output, maybe you, know, you might write in aim two of your work, that by the, aim, by the end of aim two, we will know which genes are targeted by estrogen in metastatic cells of the breast or, or whatever, whatever it is. But what you're doing there to the reviewer and to the panel is, is showing that you, you know what you're actually going to get out of that series of experiments and how important that's going to be. And if you don't have specific outputs, your, your work is in danger of just becoming a sort of rambling series of experiments you'd quite like to do. Um, so if you, if you have built in specific outputs, often with milestones attached, so it might be milestone one at 12 months, 
the specific output of AIM1 will be that I will now know which genes are regulated by, you know, whatever. So that sort of structure shows to the reviewers and to the panel that actually you understand exactly where you want to head with this work. Now, when I write grants, um, I, I increasingly try and see the grant through the eyes of the grants panel who will judge it. And, they, you know, for any grant that you write, it will be awarded or not by the grant panel. They, they are the people who make the decision. And if you try and see it through their eyes, it, it will give a different perspective. So what will happen is um, maybe 15 or 20 people will sit in a darkened room with no windows for two days uh, looking at 100 grants or whatever. And of those 15 or 20 people who are on the panel, probably only two or three will read your grant in intimate detail. Some of the others might glance at it, some of them might not but they will be led mainly by those two or three people who read it in detail. So it's important to know for whatever grant you send your, for whatever panel you send your grant to, who is on that panel and who's most likely to be reading yours? You know, do they hate that area of work? Do they love that area of work? You know, is, is there something you can do to match that? So again, as an example here in, in, the, in the Wellcome Trust, I mean, very often we would have 85 proposals to look at over two days. Each panel member would have, you know, up to 15 grants to read and comment on. Um, so finding out who's on the panel is important. And if you imagine that your proposal is the 84th proposal of 85 that those people are looking at over two long days and nights, you know, what is going to make your grant stand out? What's going to make your grant a pleasure to read? And what's going to capture the imagination of the panel member? Now, that's only half the battle. So thinking what the panel want is one thing, but then you also, your grant also has to be fit for purpose for those external reviewers because they will come at it from a different angle. The panel member will understand the science of your proposal, but they may not be an expert in androgen signaling or whatever it is that you work on. The external reviewer will be an expert. So it has to inspire the panel, but it also has to be correct and rigorous so that the external reviewer is going to say, look, yeah, I work in this field and, and this is this is useful work. So if we look at um, small and local grants, um, and I would say if we said that was sort of between 10,000 euros and 100,000 euros in, in that kind of ballpark, these tend to be uh, less transparent uh, grants really and more sort of political or strategic grants than, than larger applications. Um, it's no easier to get these than, than larger grants, but actually it's less work. And, you know, we all know that funding is not linear. There are many times in our careers and maybe every two or three years when funding is critical and smaller grants can help tide you over. They can be, you know, absolute gold dust. For small grants, you know, I would implore you to, uh, if it's in your university, for example, uh, to find out who is on the panel, to contact them. Usually people on panels don't mind being contacted. They can always tell you if they don't want to be. But you might ask them, look, uh, what kind of stuff does the panel really want to fund? You know, what stuff does it not like at the moment? And this might not always be obvious. Um, so I would I would suggest for smaller grants, you should talk to people who may be on those panels and see, get an inside uh, track. They can only say no to you, but they won't be offended. So, you know, one great proponent of, of course, this sort of grant uh, is ESE, who are obviously uh, driving this um, symposium at the moment. Um, and here are a list of um, the ESE grants that you may benefit from. Um, I've put the website uh, there below. So please do look at these different grants offered by ES ESE. Some of them are really fantastic. And in fact, I I've just got a short term uh, fellowship grant for someone to come and uh, join my uh, lab from Poland. Okay, what about PhD studentship grants? Um, these, these can be easier to obtain than project grants or program grants or, or fellowships. Um, the only problem with gaining a PhD studentship grant is that um, often you have to have uh, supervised or co-supervised a PhD student previously. They won't just let you have a PhD student if you've never supervised anyone, of course. You may spend a lot of time training PhD students, but it's a very rewarding thing. And I've had uh, 25 PhD students and three MD students. I've got three more coming. Um, and PhD students, you often have to put a lot of time into them and they're not very productive to at least a year or so in, which is, which is great, but they can be a great experience and a useful way of uh, establishing your lab and helping generate data towards larger applications. If we look more broadly at fellowships, um, I think it doesn't matter what stage of your career you're at, the same things pertain, that they're all about the three Ps, person, project and place. It's all about the right candidate doing an innovative project 
in the best institutes. And as I say, for mid, early and late careers, that's, that's really what you want. Um, sorry, that's my son ringing me. Um, so um, for an early career fellowship, um, often it's about travel, uh, it's about going to different countries, different labs, uh, picking up different techniques, uh, learning different experiences, etc., etc. Mid-career, uh, that tends to be about establishing independence and control over your research direction. And I'm sorry, my son is ringing me. I, I, I don't know if I can turn this off. Go away, son, please, please. Um, Mid-career then is about establishing independence and control over your research direction. And uh, later career is, is much more about consolidating your group and your position in the field. But this is, this is a critical point here, that there's, there's only going to be certain moments in your uh, career when you are competitive for a fellowship. This is not a linear thing. You may go 10 years in your, fellowship, in your, in your career when you're not competitive for any fellowship. Um, so, you know, it, when those moments arise that you are competitive, then, then really that's when you've got to go for it. So here's some, just some general pointers on getting ready for a fellowship and being in the right uh, moment for a fellowship. So I think you need to look closely at your own research achievements and, and ask yourself, is this the correct stage of your career to apply for a fellowship? Are you competitive? Is your CV where it needs to be? Have you got the right ideas and support in place? Will you be able to make a, an original scientific uh, or significant scientific contribution? Um, you also need to look at your, uh, your publications. You know, how are they shaping up? Have you got uh, momentum at this moment? Um, are you publishing in the right journals? What's your position as author? And of course, this is a, a, a lifelong, um, and I'm sorry I'm battling with another telephone here, is this is a lifelong uh, issue to, to build your careers. But the important thing here, have you just published two or three really good papers uh, which have uh, boosted your uh, momentum? Thirdly, um, you know, you build again through your career um, awards and prizes, talks at conferences, uh, and uh, you know, part of the job here as well is demonstrate, demonstrating that extended commitment to those goals, which all, always sells well with uh, research panels. Um, fourthly, um, and I, I touched on this earlier, uh, is the, the relevance to the funder's mission. Um, you know, you have to ask yourself, and again, see through the lens of that, that right. funding panel. Are you a good fit for the funder? Um, can you um, identify priority areas that the funder has and calls will go out from time to time that they, you know, funders want to put you know, research in this direction? You know, is your research a good hit with that? And of course it's worth, you know, good ideas always sell well, uh, whatever happens. So and what, what I want to say here is, is that, um, and again, this, this, this speaks to my um, experience of being on panels is that um, you really should contact the panel that you're thinking of, of ten, sending your fellowship to or your project grant or, or your program grant. Uh, there are administrators who work on these panels uh, and they're always keen actually to, to talk to um, scientists who are going to apply because what they don't want is people wasting their time uh, applying if they're not going to be competitive. So I would suggest emailing, ringing up uh, uh, the administrators of, of uh, large funders when you're about to apply and saying, look, this is the kind of thing I'm thinking of applying for. Do you think it's going to be competitive? What is the panel like at the moment? And again, that can be that can make all the difference in what you actually end up writing and submitting. And then, of course, you need to think about your scientific quality at this moment. Um, you know, what, what are the strengths of your work? Are, are they strong enough? Are, is what you're writing establishing the importance and novelty? Uh, can you orientate the reader to the importance of the project? Can you develop the logic and describe the, the timeline and, and the sequence of experiments? But more important than that, really, is are the two weaknesses here. And these, you know, what you have to do when you write your grant is really be realistic about the potential pitfalls of what you're going to do. No one wants to read a grant where you're going to say, look, we're going to do this and we're going to, uh, everything's going to work. It's going to be terrific. You know, people want a considered um, uh, opinion, really, as you write your piece of, of, OK, well, look, if this doesn't work, we will come at it via a different angle and that might get around this problem. That's a discussion and I think that's that's an important thing. I think the, the, the second weakness um, to consider here is, you know, a, this this does kill a lot of grants, is, is not overselling the translational importance and impact of your work. Um, if you write, you know, I'm going to cure PCOS with this or, or this work will definitely cure cancer, you know, you're going to irritate people from the outset. What you, what you want to write are phrases like, you know, this work will provide um, uh, absolutely new Inf information and insight into the important condition of whatever which may lead to therapeutic benefit you know so don't don't oversell don't don't promise the world because you know as scientists we don't like wild uh, over ambition 
So in terms of fellowships, whether it's mid, you know, mid career or early career or late, later career, um, if you're moving an institution, and that tends to be more in your, in your early and, and, and mid ones, of course, you know, you have to very, very carefully choose that uh, host institution. Has it got the right equipment, facilities, collaborators, expertise that will help you in your uh, drive towards independence or furthering your independence? And of course, reviewers know very well uh, what other institutions have and who's there and what equipment's there. And so, you know, again, that you've got to you've got to get that across very clearly. So just specifically on, on early career fellowships, um, I think your PhD supervisor will always cast a large shadow over your, your subsequent work. And, and the goal of early career fellowships is to start that movement away from your PhD supervisor in the nicest um, possible way. And you do that by picking an exciting but doable project, something that's close to your heart, making use of effective mentorship team because early career fellowships are all about mentorship and making sure you have the right support. And I would also encourage the earlier career people amongst us to, to look at a map of the world and look at the best labs and be ambitious. You know, really look at that map and say, right, where am I gonna do uh, this work and what am I gonna do? So I think we all get judged as scientists at multiple levels all the way through our career. And we get judged um, you know, on our academic achievements, the degrees we did, the postdocs we did, who, where, what, you know, the papers we published, where they were, the techniques we can do, the conferences, the grants, the teaching supervision, you know, our hobbies, you know, everything. We get judged uh, endlessly as, as scientists. For a panel though, they, they will judge you very differently. And I think for an early fellow uh, fellowship application, this is the, the, the uh, the ranking order really of how that panel will look at you. I mean, and larger font means more importance. So really original papers is, is, is the most important thing. Interesting techniques that you've got that might enable you to, to push on in your own research direction, academic, academic achievements, you know, referee letters, small grants, that's all terrific. After that really it tails off and panels aren't particularly interested uh, in, in those uh, other things. In the later fellowship, um, of course, papers are everything, but then other things that come into play are academic achievements more so, literature reviews, so you know, your, your status in the field, do you push the agenda in the field, are you someone writing those uh, literature reviews that put your spin on what you think is important? You know, conference talks, are you giving big symposium talks? And university roles actually become quite important as well. So we're all judged on 10 or 15 different things all the time, and that changes uh, in, in terms of what level you are in your career and, and what panels would expect from you. But it, in general, I think we can just say that these are the sort of seven things that all panel uh, members would look for in, in good candidates. Evidence of, of get up and go, of making things happen, of sustained excellence, of sustained endeavour, of resilience, of independence, of initiative and ability. And I think those are the kind of things when you talk about fellowships that, that, that people really, really want to see. So whether it's a project grant or a program grant or a fellowship or whatever, these I've just listed here some, um, some suicidal things that you should definitely, definitely avoid because these will kill your grant, okay? Where AIM-1 is necessary and if it fails, everything else is gone, then that is straight in the bin. Uh, if you don't put any contingencies or alternative methodologies in so you know you say look it's just going to work it's great uh, and you don't consider other ways of coming at things of course if you exceed the word count or page count or the budget that's straight in the bin if you're wildly over ambitious of course you know panels won't look very uh, kindly on that people like ambition it's just not too much ambition in my uh, for me uh, three is the magic number three aims in a project four at a maximum if you put a project in with six or seven uh, aims, your reviewer will be furious by the time they've reached about aim five or six because it's just too many aims to take in. If you write something that's boring, uh, that you, you're unlikely to uh, excite your reviewers or the panel. Uh, if your preliminary data isn't it, it convincing, then no one's gonna think that the, the stuff you're gonna do when you get the money is gonna be convincing either. If you write an iterative project, that's also suicidal. And by an iterative project, what I mean is a project where other people have done work, say, in one cell line, and you decide that you're going to do it in another cell line. You know, you've, you've got to be much more ambitious and, and, and uh, innovative than that. Um, if you don't have correct ethics, etc., for animal and human studies, that's a no-no, and a lot of funders will actually just blanket reject at that point. If you don't have uh, clear outputs, as I uh, envisaged earlier, your output one, output two, again, that just comes across as a list of experiments you'd quite like to do if you could have the money. And again, that's not a, an active way to get funding. 
If you can't enunciate or describe a clear vision, of course, again, you're not going to inspire anyone. Um, you have to be able to describe your science and communicate your science, and there's an art to doing that. For early fellowships, if you don't escape your PhD supervisors, eventually that will be seen as a lack of ability to become independent. And for later fellowships, if you don't uh, have ambition, then that, that will be uh, uh, deathly as well to your, to your chances. You've got to be pushing on there and, and, and really leading the field. And then I think, you know, as, as I've sort of touched on before, if you don't match the current research priorities of the funder, um, then again, it's not going to sail. You need to look at what the funder really wants at that moment and make sure you're, you're bang on it. So I'm just going to end with three or four very quick slides um, of general attributes that you need for success to apply for grants. Um, so some of the things that you need that I haven't spoken about as much maybe are, you know, your writing skills. If you don't write well, and we don't all write well, uh, find someone who does, find someone who can help you uh, with your writing. But you need to be persistent, you need to be creative in your ideas, you need to think laterally, think innovatively, think, you know, imaginatively. You need to be patient, you need to have a thick skin, there will be lots of rejection coming your way, you need to be rigorous and hard working. And I think uh, reading is, is, is very underrated but you really must do lots of uh, reading and this is um, a Westheimer's principle that I'm fond of reminding my laboratory members about a couple of months in the laboratory can frequently save a couple of hours in the library so you must stay current and up to date and if you do that you make sure that your ideas are fresh and innovative and whatever you write is right there at the cutting edge of stuff it's not predicated on papers you read two or three years ago Persistence is, is critical. Um, quitters never win. Research is a long, tough career. Um, applying for grants is tough. You have to be persistent. You have to accept from the outset that that is how your career is going to be, because it's like that for everyone. And as Lance Armstrong, the uh, cyclist, once said, pain is temporary, glory lasts forever. Although, of course, he was taking a lot of drugs when he said that. And then you need uh, to have a thick skin. So as I said, lots of failure and rejection and low points, but it's a very rewarding career. You are free to pursue your ideas and you ha just have to know that you're gonna have to come back and back, but you will get there in the end. So these are the people I write grants for. Um, this is a little bit out of date, this photo, because we haven't been in the laboratory for three or four months because of COVID-19. Um, but these are the people that keep me awake at night. Uh, I have to write grants to keep them because they're wonderful people and uh, they, they do some brilliant science. And um, yeah, I, I'll end there. And uh, thanks for your attention. I'm really sorry for the interruptions. Uh, we're about to go on holiday and uh, my wife and children are uh, packing and, and doing lots of stuff in the background and we're getting phone calls left, right, etc. But thank you for your attention anyway, cheers. Okay, thank you, Chris. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy that. Uh, the questions are now starting to flood in, so I'm going to try and uh, catch up a few of these uh, in order of their arrival, pretty much, because um, uh, there's not been many thumbs up on these. Uh, I want to start with a question from uh, Reluca, who basically wants to understand how we can break the vicious cycle of how we go from getting a good CV to good publications and then to winning grants, when often winning grants require us to already have a good CV and the publications. And this is a constant battle, I think, for all PIs and all scientists across all of their careers. I still get asked this question often. Despite my funding, why have I not had enough papers? And then when I go for funding, why have I not uh, uh, shown previous evidence of enough funding and enough publications? This is something that reviewers use to beat you down often if they don't have, to my mind at least, uh, something more productive to say. If you're an early career, as Chris has said, you start with the small grants and you start to accumulate small but significant pots of money and you need to show uh, varying degrees of independence and eventually you break into the next tier and the next tier and hopefully that then builds the CV sufficient that you can then go for the larger grants. The publications will come um, and again in team science we don't have to worry, uh, we're not meant to worry I should say, so much about our position on publications if we can justify the contributions we've made to these and this is a good example of that is when we have multi authorships on GWAS uh, uh, publications, for instance, in which you can do a huge amount of bioinformatic work, but don't get the first or senior authorship. You have to then justify your position on those papers. The break in the vicious cycle is a tough one, but I think it starts about how you accumulate the evidence of your contributions and your CV building. And eventually it should pay off as you go for those bigger grants. 
I wanted to come to a question from uh, Ramel. And the question is, is it a consideration if an applicant belongs to a resource limited region? Uh, yes, it does. Um, if we consider a resource limited university, uh, think in the UK, we all know that there are some uh, universities that are considerably uh, uh, richer than others. Um, these do take part in the consideration for good and for bad. Um, and I think this is a, a problem that we face in the UK, particularly as to how we judge individuals from universities that have uh, poor resources to support locally, but actually have great scientists with great ideas. If you are from a low middle income country, then actually grant funders should take this into consideration. The Wellcome Trust and the MRC do have schemes and do take consideration of such, such grant applications, particularly if you're part of collaborative uh, applications that want to fund uh, researchers in areas of the world that have major global health issues that aren't able to address it through their own national schemes. Uh, Chris, do you have any further comments on that? I think that's quite a, quite a useful question. Oh, I, I, it's a great question. And I think um, it, all funding is resource limited, um, you know, some, some more than others. Um, you know, we, we're always fighting for a small amount of, of not much money. Um, but yeah, I, I think, as you say, Gareth, some funders make allowance for that. Um, and I think there's no, there's no magic answer to this. I mean, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's making yourself as competitive as you can be for whatever funding, whether it's 10 million pounds or whether it's 10 pounds, you know, you've just got to make yourself as competitive as possible. Okay. Um, a question from Helen. Is there anything more that professional associations such as ESE can provide to help its members submit grant applications successfully? Um, I think often the institute that you're part of should be providing a certain level of care in this regard uh, and shouldn't just be relying on your professional associations or the societies that you are members of. I think most uh, professional association societies that you are members of will provide a lot of wraparound care but if you're not getting it locally from your institute or your university you need to consider your position there or find it within that system. Um, we as Christopher alluded to uh, have set up quite an extensive uh, care package around this in terms of grant clinics, uh, interview techniques, uh, iteratively going over grants and, and career structures to, to avoid the need to feel that individual is left adrift. Uh, we find that this is a really, really useful scheme. Uh, the individuals benefit greatly, not just for the amount of grants they, that they can capture, but also as their onward careers, because these are transferable skills that, that operate across many different uh, sectors. Not all individuals are going to go on to certain academic careers that, that we're talking about here, but actually the skills that can go into place for learning to handle uh, the writing commitments of, of large applications to interview techniques, uh, so on, are, are really useful. And the Institute should be providing those to you. If they're not, then you should need to maybe bring that up as a local concern. Um, we have a question now from um, Bassam. Does it mean that I need to escape my PhD supervisor for the first grant application after PhD completion? Um, Chris, do you have a comment yeah. as a chair of the panel? Yeah, I, I will, and thanks, thanks for that question. Uh, I mean, maybe I was a little bit um, didactic about that, um, you know, because of the scheme that I used to chair. I mean, I, I think it's just, um, it's a slow process, um, sometimes dissociating yourself from your PhD supervisor. The trouble is, when you do experiments um, in your PhD, the outward uh, impression is that the PhD supervisor has thought of the experiments and is telling you the experiments to do, and therefore you're kind of just doing what you're told. Now, we all know that that's not really the case in real life, and, and for my PhD students, uh, and, I, and I know for Gareth's as well, we, we always try and push them towards independence, you know, early in, in, the, in the career. Um, I think, uh, to answer your question directly though, I think when you've finished your PhD, for your, for your first grant, I think it's it's fine to um, to have your PhD supervisor on if it's a project grant, and if you can demonstrate in it that you've you're clearly driving the direction of travel. Because the danger is if you get one postdoc in and maybe another postdoc in with your same PhD supervisor, that it, it appears that you're not that sort of person who's going to become the, their own principal investigator and their own boss. So it, it's, a, it's a slow process and you don't have to escape your PhD supervisor immediately, but you do have to have that in mind. You need an exit strategy so that you can be seen to be the person who's now pushing your own direction over the next few years. 
Okay. The next question is, Mark, um, is there a certain amount of preliminary data that panels like to see? And is the amount you put in dependent on the size of the grant? Um, I think there is some correlation there. Um, obviously, if you've got a huge program grant that's two or three million pounds or whatever the, the currency you're working in, then you need a lot of evidence, both for feasibility and the collaborative networks that you've got, they actually work. You can do a lot of the work and that the innovation you want to put into it can be handled in some, some capacity. But often if you have an absolutely killer piece of data, that can carry the need then for, for extensive preliminary evidence if you've got the world's best idea. Now, you, you can't judge that yourself, but it's not always uh, linear. Um, I've recently reviewed grants in which have had what I would consider relatively small amounts of preliminary data, but the evidence they do provide was spot on and I, I was blown away by it. So it's not always the case that you need to feel the bulk. I think this needs to be some evidence that you've got a good idea, then it has legs and that there's also evidence of feasibility, particularly if you are more junior, um, because if you can't show that you can at least handle the majority of the work as you push the innovation, then you're going to struggle at panel. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you have another comment on there again, because that is quite a, quite an important question. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. There's no there's no right answer to this, of course. But uh, I mean, there are some uh, funders that I can think of that actually welcome really novel uh, approaches that don't have much preliminary data they they really want something to come out of left field that's really kind of um, you know exciting and hasn't been done for the last five years others as gareth alluded to if you go for a program grant that you have to have a weight of evidence behind you that, that what you want to do for the next five years is going to work and has got momentum and you know that you know, it, it's, we all tread that fine line. I think, you know, only you can really answer that. You've got to look at the balance of what you write and say, is there enough innovation here to take me away just from the preliminary data I've generated versus is there enough proof that what I'm proposing to do uh, may actually work? So it's a fine line and, it, and it's, it's different for each circumstance. Okay, next question is from Craig. Um, Thank you for the advice, he says. Uh, do you have a specific process for overcoming a really harsh grant review? Um, probably all have our personal ones, which is usually to start firing around some really angry emails to people, complaining about the system, go and have a little cry. Um, then you've got to go and take some time out for yourself and have a little think, and then really look at that grant review. What could be harsh an initial review can actually be really quite telling. Uh, have they actually found the fatal flaw in your grant? Have they actually read the grant properly and actually, you know, hand on heart, you realize that actually they are, that the review is, is accurate. Then you've got to face that and use that, use it constructively to go back and, and if you, if you get an opportunity to, to rebut, then, then be courteous and gracious for the review. Don't, be harsh in, in rebuttal. Uh, look at each point and ask the question to yourself, uh, is it right? Have they, can I redress it? Can I use it positively? Um, there are occasions when the harsh review is unjustly harsh. And I think sometimes as a, as, a, as a group of people, we don't need to take it. We can ask the funding panel to, to say, you know, this isn't in the spirit of, of constructive scientific progress. Um, I think sometimes we do take these things um, a little bit too far and, and it can be deconstructing. So my process is to get a little bit agitated, go away and think about it, and then really look at that, that in depth and then see if I can use it constructively, both in rebuttal and then for taking it forward into the next round of grants. Because uh, if we don't learn from these processes, then, then we're going to gonna struggle to improve on our science. I mean, maybe, Gareth, if I could just come in, I think the most difficult one, uh, and I think it was someone called Craig who uh, who asked the question, is that is when you get um, inaccurate review uh, stuff through where, you know, someone's um, not understood the grant or, or thinks, you know, has done a very, very quick job on it and hasn't really, um, you know, understood all the concepts and then just gives you a terrible score. I mean, that, that is really, really difficult to deal with. Um, you know, I, I mean, uh, you know, like Gareth, I mean, it, when those things happen to me, then I, you know, I, I do a lot of running actually, or go to the gym or whatever, and let off a bit of steam. I might go to the pub, um, not necessarily, you know, you, yeah, in that order. It's better to do it in that order, of course. Uh, but you, um, but you find a way of coping and you digest it, and maybe a few days later, for me anyway, I, I then come back to it properly. But I, I like to sort of break it down and digest it, and you know, understand, <laughs> you know, the, the good and the bad and the ugly of it. 
Okay, um, another question from Bassam. Um, do co-authorships also count? Um, yes, of course they do. Um, I think if it's a, like I said earlier, if it's a, a huge multi-author paper, it can sometimes get lost of what your contribution is. And in your grants, if you get the opportunity, you need to bring that out. You need to be able to demonstrate that actually all of those 50, 60 authors on there, my contribution was this, X, Y, Z, and then you clarify exactly what that role was. I think in team science these days, we, we, we have the opportunity to cover a lot of ground, but you can get lost your contribution. So you need to find ways in your grants to, to make people realize this. Um, there will come a point that if you only co-author papers, then you're gonna struggle to show it both independence of your research capacity and also your research independence of thought. So you need to balance it. Um, so I would, I would really work on, on being a good collaborative scientist uh, and, and working with others as much as you can, but not at the expense of your own independence and initiative. Um, Raluca again, um, how many rejections before rethinking the whole project? <laughs> um, this is a tough one because it's really, really hard to take a project and, and dump it, um, both because we have <laughs> huge amounts of time and energy invested in them, and we don't like to think that our, our ideas uh, truly do stink however there are times when we really must face the music and and say okay this is not gonna this is not gonna fly i really need to think what i'm gonna do next um the whole process of grant writing does tend to be iterative you will have failures in and around themes and projects as i've said earlier when you get these harsh reviews or you get the rejections after the dust will settled you've got to find ways of, of coming to terms with it and then also say okay let me take that feedback and use it positively to improve the science and to improve the grant. Um, if that does become a point in which it needs to end, then it needs to end. Chris has a good, will have a, a more important view on this. Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. And I think there's a difference, isn't it? If, the, if you're getting rejected and, and the reviewers' comments are all pointing in the same direction and they're all saying the same thing, you know, this is, this is not uh, realistic, you know, or, or whatever, then that's when you you accept it. I think if people if the reviewers' comments are, are mixed and some people are seeing a lot of hope in it and a lot of excitement in it, but one or two others are are not, then then I guess then you have to go back to your ideas and and mould them a little bit. So you know even in rejected grants you can see lots of positivity actually. It can be loads of people who love your grants. You can even have fantastic scores from all five reviewers and not get the grant. And you don't get the grant because there are 100 applications and they only funded five. But what you're doing is terrific. So a rejection isn't necessarily a rejection of your ideas. It can be just a practical thing because of budget constraints, etc. So I think you have to balance those things. Okay. The next question that's just been bumped up due to a thumbs up is uh, from Li Ling. Um, does having editorial and reviewer roles help? <laughs> This comes down to a, a question of statistics to me. Um, I think technically it should do. Uh, Chris will also have a, a good view on this because he, he's actually an editor of a number of, of journals. Um, as a reviewer, it does give you a bit of insight, inf insight into the inner workings and mechanics of the funding agency in which you're usually reviewing for. And again, it always helps to read other people's science and see how grants are written and to see, understand maybe what works and what doesn't. Uh, However, in my own personal experience, if you don't write enough grants, you can't actually figure out whether the reviewing that you've been doing helps. So um, if you're funded on say a five year program and you don't write a grant for two or three years, all that reviewing you would hope go in to help the next tranche of applications. But until you've written a few and had a few rejections to notice your own uh, 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 success rate, it's hard to say. But I think it does help just as a scientist to review uh, and so I, I would actively seek these roles out as and when you can. Chris can maybe add a little bit about editorship. Yeah, no, thanks, Gareth. I, I mean, yeah, an, another great question. And I, I think it's, um, it's all part of the rich tapestry, tapestry of what you need to do to be a successful scientist. So, you know, we all have multiple roles. You know, you, my role might, may be scientist, but actually within that, there are 15 different roles. You know, I, I teach, I, uh, you know, I have PhD students, I do research, I'm an editor, you know, whatever, you know. So we all have these multiple roles and, and all of those multiple roles bring something to your abilities and your knowledge and your experience. And I think, you know, reviewing papers and reviewing grants and doing that sort of thing, it lets you see what's out there, what other people are doing, what their ideas are. Um, it allowed, enables you to see 
their work through the lens of what a reviewer sees it, which is exactly the, the you know what you do when you uh, submit your work to a journal or to to a, to a grant panel. So, I think yeah, really really useful. Don't don't do too much of it, of course, but um, but we all need um, to have as broad a perspective as possible and as much experience of how other people do science as possible, so that we can steal the great ideas that people have in terms of techniques. You know, if someone says, you know, well look why don't we use this technique you've never heard of before, then you might suddenly think, actually, that would work in my system. So it's just getting exposed to that broadest range of training that you possibly can. Okay, now we've got time. Okay, a few more questions. Um, one from Ionescu. Having finished a PhD pro program is mandatory if one wants to apply for a grant. So do I need my PhD in the bag and, and examined and, and cleared before I can go for grants? Well, it really depends on the grants that you are applying for. Um, of course, most of the major grants from any funding body across any nation will generally want you to have your PhD training uh, completed so that you can essentially move on uh, up the ladder. But there are a number of smaller grants we've alluded to, like ESE and Society for Endocrinology in the UK, in which you can apply, usually in your third year, as you come to transition to postdoctoral period, for a small pot of money, say £10,000 or, or 10,000 euros or whatever to really start to look for acquire a piece of equipment or, or uh, uh, take off, uh, get that small idea take off that happened towards that end of that, that training period. So most grants won't be available to you, but it's not mandatory for certain uh, funds, maybe your internal funds, particularly as well as your institute, if you have such schemes. Um, so, you know, you've got to seek these out and look for these. Um, and depending on, again, which country you're in will depend on what you can probably apply for. Um, uh, one from Mohammed, um, to how much extent the budget amount matters for the gaining of, so how much, so is the, how important is the budget for, for gaining the grant? Well, again, it does depend on the, the grant that your scheme that you're applying for, whether it's a small institutional grant or a, a large funding body from a research council of your, of your country. Um, budget really is usually um, specified in the grant scheme. So again, reading the details of the application which you're making. Um, it's very clear when you read a grant, if somebody knows what they're doing in terms of budget according to the experiments that they've described and plan to, to carry out. Um, a good example is if is in and around animal costs. For me, this is what I often see is Somebody might have done a very, very good justification for the animals they want to use in terms of power calculations and ethics. But then the number does not make any sense compared to the work they want to conduct. And that usually is a red light to say, well, actually, this grant is just looking to uh, uh, pay for uh, research costs that are not to do with this grant. And they're basically just fishing for extra money. And that's usually a red light for somebody like me. Um, so it does take a bit of time to think about your grants and your, your budgeting so that you are fair to the funder and actually need the money to do the experiments. And, uh, those two are intimately linked because if you're not budgeting correctly, your experiments can't be that right. And if they're not correct, then there's something wrong with the science. Chris. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question, Mohammed. I think the thing is that um, there's a tactical game to be played with some um, funders when it comes to how much money do you ask for. So as an example, um, the Medical Research Council of the UK uh, usually in each round awards about eight to 10 project grants and that they may range from half a million pounds to a million pounds. Now, if you, if you put in a grant for 999,999 pounds, that has to be a fantastic grant because otherwise they could fund two of the half a million pound grants for the same money as your grant. So you make yourself vulnerable then if, if, you, if you're asking for exactly the top amount of money when actually you know, it's an ultra competitive round. The opposite argument also applies though. If you go in for say, £300,000 or £400,000, it may be seen as not being ambitious enough, that you, you're not really pushing hard enough with what you want to achieve. So um, for each funder, there are, there are those tactical things. If it's a small project grant and it's, let's say, €50,000, you, you really should be put, putting a grant in for about €50,000. But if it's a, uh, a bigger scheme and there are other factors at play, then I guess you 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 balance, do I make this a big, big, ambitious, huge sum of money at the cost of, of making myself vulnerable because 
uh, for that money, they could fund two others. So, you know, again, it comes down to the dynamics of how a fu funding panel work, and it's different for every scheme. Okay, I think we'll make this the last question due to time. Um, so the last question is from Nadal. How many publications must I have to publish before applying for a grant? Again, this is uh, it's a good question because it depends on the scheme, it depends on the grant, it depends on the stage of your career. And also a lot of funding bodies uh, uh, are agnostic, at least they are philosophically, to such considerations of the journal you publish in and the metrics around that, such as journal impact factor. However, there's always a disconnect between what a funder thinks they want and what a reviewer actually reviews you on. So my take on this is do quality work and publish, but be aware that you may be judged on where you publish and how many you publish. But again, if you're publishing a big, huge impactful nature paper, it's always going to look shinier in a reviewer's eyes than uh, even two or three or four first author papers in what somebody might consider a very subject uh, niche area okay we'd like to think that shouldn't be the case but actually uh, these are things we are reviewed on and there'll be unconscious biases in the reviewers eyes that that, that that take it that way so yes you do need to publish um, you probably need multiple publications as you go up the 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 grant uh, ladder in terms of, of how much money you can ask for and how eligible you are in terms of your CV and career trajectory. So uh, Chris, again, will have some more insight on this given his, his positions on. Well, I, I think, I think Gareth's a hundred percent right. And um, for the Wellcome Trust, for example, they've signed up to this initiative and I, I'm, unfortunately I've forgotten the name of the initiative, but um, it's an uh, initiative where they don't look at the impact factor of the journal that it's published in. So if you, and we had cases of people putting in who had one paper and it was a first author publication in Cell uh, and someone else might have two publications in, in, in what we would describe as a lesser journal. And, and sometimes that person with the two smaller papers might get it rather than the one Cell paper because all sorts of other factors come into play. You know, you, you may be the first author on that publication, but were you just doing what your supervisor was telling you to do? Were you just working in a great lab that already had lots of data and lots and lots of expertise? Or were you making things happen in a small lab where you drove it and you got out a reasonable publication? So there's all sorts of complexities when it comes to uh, publications. But as Gareth says, there's, there's a difference between what reviewers might think and what the panel might think. The reviewers, we do tend to take impact factors seriously. And no matter what we sign up to, it, it's difficult to look past an impact factor of 100 or you know, 20 or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what, what the panel are really looking for are evidence, you know, that no matter how many papers you've published and what journals are there in, that, that you've got that evidence of sustained endeavor that you, 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 you've worked for a while, you'll keep, you keep making it happen, you keep putting data out there, you keep trying, you keep doing your thing. So, you know, that to me, that resilience, that, that continual effort, that's what your papers reveal in you. And I think that's, that's critical. Okay, I think we'll draw the session to a close given that we're at the hour. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Hope you find it of some use. We will try and follow up any further questions uh, online um, through the ESE. Um, on behalf of Chris and myself, uh, we hope you have a good rest of the week and uh, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.